So we had an 11 year old female who complained of swelling on the left side of the neck and the swelling was painless. So you see that whenever a young patient comes to you with a swelling in the neck, the first thing that you do is an ultrasound. So we did the ultrasound and ultrasound found a lesion which was completely cystic, showing homogeneously low level echoes. There was no solid component, no calcification, no color flaps, absolutely. So we decided to get a CT done because the patient was to be operated for it. So I wanted to just have a look at the cine loop. I don't want you to make any presumptive diagnosis. We'll be again following a schematic approach. That is, we'll be talking about the location of the lesion. Then we'll be talking about the radiological features. And then we'll be talking about the list of differentials that we have. So I hope that all of you have looked at the entire cine loop. I'll show you the place where the pathology is. So pathology lies somewhere here. What do you see here? We can clearly see that on the left side here, there is a cystic lesion. There is a cystic lesion. Now, this is nothing new because cystic lesion we could see also on ultrasound. What is important is its location because whenever we want to be talking about the cystic lesions of the neck and typically the congenital and development cystic lesions, the location of the lesion is going to be prime importance because it is going to tell us the diagnosis. In this particular case, we can see a lesion is located in the neck. Okay. And it is located where? It is located just anterior to the carotid and the HME. And it is also located anterior to the sternocleidal So if I have to mention the neck space, I would say that it is probably lying in the anterior cervical space. And if I talk about the relations, this cyst is located anterior to the carotid artery, IJV, and the sternomastoid. Or conversely, you can also say that sternomastoid, carotids, and IJV are located posterior to this particular cyst. Anything else which may be of importance in this particular case? We don't see anything. I mean, it is actually located in the anterior cervical space and it is extending a bit up to the region of the thyroid bone. And beyond that, I don't see there is any significant extension of it, although a smiled extension can be seen in the submandibular region, but it is predominantly the cervical region where the cyst is placed. So it's placed somewhere here, a bit of extension into the submandibular space is questionable. So let's have a look at the static images which will help us in identifying the location as well as the relationships in a better fashion. So this is what we already discussed. Now I want you to have a look at this particular image. Tell me, what is it basically related to? It is present on the left side of the neck, very clear. But now you can see that it is also extending up to the submandibular space because this is the submandibular gland. On this side, you can see the submandibular gland quite well. Here, the inferior part of the submandibular gland appears to have been pushed by this particular lesion, which is very well seen even on this sagittal deformant image. So the next spaces that are affected are anterior cervical space along with extension into the submandibular space. Submandibular space. Now the question is, what is the provisional diagnosis? So I'll just write down cystic lesion of neck, which is likely a benign cystic lesion. And since this is a patient who is a pediatric patient, there is a high possibility of it being either congenital or developmental. Do you see any complex features? No. On CT, there were none. There's no perifocal inflammation. There's no perifocal infiltration. I don't see any solid component. I don't see any fat also. Presence of fat is very important because whenever you see fat, you think about dermoid cysts. Any additional findings? I just can see compression over the vessels. Apart from that, I don't see any additional findings. The question is treatment. Treatment is a bit difficult. You know, whenever you're going to talk about cysts, which are congenital or developmental cysts, usually these cysts have deeper extension. So the treatment is surgical, but there's going to be a different type of surgery, possibly marsupialization or something else. So treatment is definitely surgical. There's no conservative treatment for it, what we know about. Now, let's actually discuss upon this thing, which is provisional diagnosis. Now, I know that you might have already come across such cases in your life. And I hope that all of you, from your knowledge of PG entrance also, know that there is a thing which is called as brain kill cleft cyst. So we gave a differential of brain kill cleft cyst as a primary differential in our case and it the patient got operated and it was confirmed also. But this is not the reason why I want you to have a look at this case. I want you to have a look at this case because once you see this type of a case, keep a pictographic memory into it, you should be knowing that a brain kill cleft cyst looks like this. Secondly, the reason why I want you to have a look at this case is that you should also know how to classify the brain kill cleft anomalies. We know the brain kill cleft anomalies are typically first to fourth and all of them have different locations and this is how you diagnose them by looking at the locations. So the easiest thing to remember is the first one is going to be anterior most and when we reach the fourth one it's going to be either posterior most or the inferior most or the caudal most whatever you call it. So let us have a look at this case first. Where do you see this anomaly is lying? This anomaly is lying 
anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. And mind you, sternocleidomastoid also is a very, very important deterministic factor in differentiation of second and third brachial cleft cyst. So if you find a cyst which is present anterior to sternocleidomastoid, I hope you already know the answer. It's the second brachial cleft cyst. And if you find something which is located here in the posterior cervical space that is posterior to the sternocleidomastoid, it is a third brachial cleft cyst. Another important fun fact I would like to tell you is that third brachial cleft cysts are exceedingly uncommon, while second brachial cleft cysts are in the commonest of all type of brachial cleft cysts that we see around. So, this type of a cyst, which is unilocular, which is present in an asymptomatic child, typically during early years of infancy, and you see any no more complexities located anterior. Now, this is a very important word anterior to the sternocleidomastoid are going to be typically the type 2 brachial cleft cysts. They say that it is located in the region of the angle of the mandible and anterior to the sternocleidomastoid. Now, one very important sign that they have talked about in cases of brachial cleft cysts, that is type 2 brachial cleft cysts, is in this particular case, the cyst is ending at the level of the carotid bifurcation. I hope everybody of you can see that the cyst ends where the carotid bifurcation begins. So, if you have a cyst which insinuates between the ICA and the ECA, this is called as a notch sign. What do we call it? We call it a notch sign. And this notch sign is actually highly, highly specific for brachial cleft cyst. Notch sign means whenever you see these two vessels and you find the cyst which is insinuating into it, that's going to be called a notch sign. Now, this is something which is rare to get. First of all, brachial cleft cysts are itself rare anomalies. And if you get a cystic lesion, with a positive notch sign, then you can be sure or not. But even then, if you don't see a notch, but you see this type of a classical appearance, then you know what you're dealing with. 